Um, welcome everyone to this uh, very special afternoon here in Berkeley, California afternoon, but it's probably a lot of different uh, times all over the world, wherever you're zooming in from. Um, I'm Natalia Brizuela. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley and with Victoria Colis Butelesi and Leticia Sabsai. I'm the co-editor of the Critical South book series at Polity in the UK, where we have recently published Sueli Rolnik's Spheres of Insurrection, Notes on Decolonizing the Unconscious. Everyone go get this book if you don't already have it, if you haven't read it, if you're unable to read it in Portuguese or Spanish, here it is in English. Uh, this book series, the Critical South series, um, publishes the work of key scholars and intellectuals from the Global South, whose interventions complicate the North-South divide and the established Euro-American canon of what has been called critical theory. The book series is one of the projects of the International Consortium for Critical Theory Programs, of which I am co-PI with my dear friend and colleague, Samir Esmir, the consortium is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Berkeley. And I'm grateful to both uh, for their commitment and support of this book series, which has allowed for translations such as uh, the one we'll be talking about today, Sueli Rolnik's book and many others um, to, to circulate in, in, in English, uh, because as we know, uh, that has historically been one of the reasons or excuses, we should say, for um, the continuation of a kind of single world paradigm uh, in as much as it also gets reflected in theoretical debates. Um, so I'm grateful to the commitment of the Mellon Foundation and Berkeley's Office of the Chancellor for Research for making the book series possible as well as numerous other projects that Samira Smith and I have been directing since 2020. I want to take you know, this moment to thank the members of the consortium team as well as the members of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research for the work that they've done to set up and run today's event. I in particular want to thank Brianna George and Marlena Gittelman who are here with us, although not visible to all of you uh, in the audience. I wanna thank all of you uh, for being here, all 108 participants now, a couple minutes into my presentation, um, for being here today, joining us for this conversation that I am sure will be magnificent and the celebration of uh, you know, Sueli's um, book being published in English. And then I want to thank, uh, last but not least, uh, today's panelists. First and foremost, I want to thank Sueli Rolni for having written this and many other books which have helped shape scholarship and public debate, debates for decades. Um, and I also want to thank her for the generosity and the confianza in allowing us to, to bring this book into the series and into these set of conversations. Uh, it's been an honor to work with you, Sueli, and also with the translator for this book, Sergio Delgado Moja, who I saw placed a message in the chat. Thank you, Sergio, for your beautiful translation. I'm going to introduce our panelists and also um, say a few words about the format. Sueli Rolnik needs no introduction, but of course I will introduce her. Sueli is a Brazilian psychoanalyst, writer, and as she says, sometimes curator. She's a full professor at the Catholic University of Sao Paulo, where she founded the Subjectivity Studies Center in the Clinical Psychology Doctoral Program. She's also been an visiting professor at numerous universities, among them at the Interdisciplinary Master of Theater and Living Arts at the Univers National University of Colombia and at the Independent Studies Program at the Museo de Art Contemporáneo in Barcelona, MACPA. She was exiled in Paris in the 1970s where she completed training in psychoanalysis and institutional psychotherapy before returning to Brazil to continue 
her studies and begin her work as an analyst. She's lectured widely and is the author of numerous essays and books. And I'm only gonna mention a couple that are the ones, uh, some of the ones that are available in English translations. Today's, you know, um, book being debated, Fears of Insurrection, Notes on Decolonizing the Unconscious, Zombie Anthropophagy from 2018, Archive Mania uh, that was published alongside Documenta 13, and Molecular Revolution in Brazil, which was uh, translated in 2006, but it, it had been published decades earlier, and that was a book co-written between Sueli and Felix Guattari. Rolnik's research is dedicated to micropolitics, especially the, and I quote, right, as she calls, colonial, racializing, heterocis patriarchal capitalist regime of the unconscious. That's hard to say in English, um, also in Portuguese. Um, and in her, her research on micropolitics, uh, she also uh, pays close attention to um, resistant devices within this sphere. To do so, her theoretical perspective has always been transdisciplinary and inextricably linked to a clinical, cultural, political pragmatics. Sueli today is joined by Raluca Sorianu and Ramsey McGlazer. Raluca is a professor of psychoanalytic studies at the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Essex. And she's also a psychoanalyst and a member of the Círculo Psicoanalítico do Rio de Janeiro. Her work sits at the intersection of psychosocial studies, psychoanalysis, social theory, and medical humanities. She's the project lead of the multidisciplinary research project FRIPSI, Free Clinics and a Psychoanalysis for the People, Progressive Histories, Collective Practices, Implications for Our Times. Raluca's most recent book, co-authored with Jenny Wilner and Jacob Stabberg, is titled Ferenci Dialogues on Trauma and Catastrophe, and it was published this year. She's also an academic associate of the Freud Museum in London. Ramsey McGlazer is Associate Professor of Comparative Literature at UC Berkeley. He studies European and Latin American literature, film, and critical theory with research interests in poetry and poetics, politics and aesthetics, and feminist, queer, and psychoanalytic theory. He's the author of Old Schools, Modernism, Education, and the Critique of Progress, and is currently working on a book titled, for now, Free Clinics, Aesthetics, Abolition, Anti-Psychiatry, um, which is about the literature, history, and ongoing afterlife of anti-psychiatry in Italy and Brazil. Ramsey is also an associate editor of Critical Times, which is another one of the projects of the consortium. And he is also a widely published translator of works of social, cultural, and psychoanalytic theory, including two books in the Critical um, South series, Eduardo Gruner's, Gruner's The Haitian Revolution, Capitalism, Slavery, and Countermodernity, and Rita Segato's The War on Women. So welcome, Sueli, Raluca, and Ramsey. Thank you for being here. We uh, are going to start with Raluca and Ramsey offering some remarks on the book. This will be followed by a response from Sueli, a conversation between the three of them that I'll help moderate. And hopefully by 1 p.m. we're going to open the, 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 the Zoom room to questions and comments from the audience. You can submit your questions through the Q&A icon. It's going to be much easier for me if you put your questions there as opposed to the chat, because otherwise I do have to scroll so too, too much. But the chat, as you all know already, is open. So um, use it as you want throughout. But um, please do share your, your questions at any moment uh, through the Q&A icon. And with that, we are going to start with Raluca. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia, and um, hello, everyone. Good evening, uh, depending on, on where you are. Um, I am Raluca Soriano. I will speak um, from London today. Um, and first of all, thank you for this um, excellent organization and for the wonderful series of books uh, 
um, to the International Consortium of Critical Theory, uh, to Natalia Brizuela herself and to Brianna George. And it's a privilege for me to share this space with um, Sueli Rolnik and Ramsey Maglazer. Um, and today we come uh, together around this extraordinary book um, and its author, um, Sueli Rolnik, uh, to explore where this book might take us as a collective, because I think fundamentally uh, this is a book about um, collectives. Um, so today um, I have organized my comments uh, into five cuts. Um, they are related not so much to my cuts into the book, but to how the book made its own cuts into the movement of my association. Um, so the first cut uh, is actually um, about cutting. Um, the colonial capitalistic unconscious is a thick fabric. It is difficult to cut into either by fantasy, by free association, by connecting what in psychoanalysis we call drive to new symbols and to the social body. It is a revitalizing exercise to be able with Sueli Rolnik and with a partner of practice she chooses in this book journey, artist Ligia Clark, to imagine and to become affected by what a cut into the colonial capitalistic unconscious might look like. Um, so I will just briefly share um, an image with all of you. Um, so uh, Sueli refers to Ligia Clark's 1963 work, um, Caminando, Walking, where the artist offered the public strips of paper, scissors, and glue with some simple instructions to cut into the paper um, shaped as a Mobius strip. So um, imagine and visualize this Mobius strip and someone cutting alongside it every time the cut reaches a point previously touched the cut must deviate slightly so as to allow the act of cutting to continue. Through this surprising materialization, both Sueli and Ligia confront us with an unsettling question, to diversify or to reproduce. Um, cutting with the aim of continuing cutting produces a new experience of space and time. As Sueli writes, Every world is a Mobius strip. We are thus invited to project the Mobius strip onto the world and experience a topological surface made up by relations between um, different bodies. Um, so um, the surprising result is a new way of seeing subjectivity outside the individual subject, a subjectivity made in the act of cutting and through being confronted with a persisting question um, to create difference or to create sameness. Um, as Sueli Rolnik writes, a subjectivity that withstands the tension that destabilizes it and that does so long enough to make possible the germination of a world with its language and its senses. The description and even photographic representation of this way of cutting brought me as, an, as a reader an extraordinary materializing force. So what is being materialized? Precisely the fragility of the modality of the cut. We can always slip from continuing the cutting to interrupting the cutting and thus produce identical short strips disconnected from one another um, and foreclosed upon their own interior. To materialize fragility is a difficult thing to do. My thoughts also went to the kind of cut afforded by psychoanalytic work. The psychoanalytic dispositif or frame or couch is ultimately a machine to make speak. 
but it is also a machine for changing the direction of speech or for reorientating speech. It is a prism, prism with its own regime of light, as Deleuze would put it. Um, it impacts the way light falls or becomes blurred and the boundaries between the visible and the invisible. My first question and invitation for Sueli is to comment on the possible alliances between psychoanalysis and art. Perhaps it is a question about points of intersection between two different dispositives, intersections that open possibilities of contact, participation, play, as well as bodily and sensual experiences. Um, so now the second cut um, is about thinking. The book brings its readers in an unexpected way, the question, what is thinking? Far from remaining a philosopher's question, this becomes a practical, clinical, artistic, and even activist question. And I believe we need to reimagine thinking, rematerializing it, retying it with bodies, picturing it as a cut, sometimes a very risky cut. This brings Sueli Rolnik in important resonance with other feminist and posthumanist thinkers who have reinscribed what it means to know or to think. Um, Donna Haraway speaks of tentacular knowledge, a kind of knowledge that takes seriously the tentacles of sea creatures um, and their way of making attachments, of fearing, of advancing and retracting. Haraway reminds us that tentacle comes from the Latin tentaculum, which means feeler, and tentare, which means to feel and to try. In a similar way, there is a material semiotic experimentation in the book we are turning to today. So I turned to a section in the book I marked out and returned to. Um, Sueli writes, considered from its ethical perspective, which governs the actions of desire on the active act end of the spectrum, thinking means listening to affects to the larval worlds generated in the body by the forces that constitute the environment. It means getting involved in the deterritorializing de uh, movement triggered by these larval worlds." Um, and I end quote. In my work, I am interested in phenomena of radical plasticity and in a democratized relation between the psyche and the soma. It's as if an organ can dream up a new word and the word can call into being new organs. This radical plasticity is not a utopian horizon, a manifesto for a world to come. It is instead an observation that starts from the consulting room, from clinical facts, from the symptoms and forms of sufferings of our patients. Organs, limbs and tissues are capable of different kinds of regression, perversions, strangulations, condensations, displacements, which we usually attribute to the psychic stratum. They are capable of meaningful compositions. Um, and I'm sure we can unpack this um, in the discussion. So I'm, I am very interested in reimagining the nature of the act of thinking Sueli Rolni talks about the wisdom of affect and about pollination, referencing the collective aspects of thinking. I speak of infrastructural thinking, a particular kind of orientation to action which looks at institutions slantwise. Infrastructural thinking is a mechanism of amplification and intensification. It is what cultural theorist Lauren Berlin calls the heterotopian impulse. In this logic of action, the boundary between the inside and the outside of a collective is not given by a list of membership or by statutes and membership keys, but by an intensification of fantasy, free association and analogy, um, which creates, even if momentarily, an effect of inside. So my question here to Sue Li is what is the role of psychoanalysis in the flourishing of the wisdom of affect or of infrastructural thinking. Um, and now the third cut um, is about resonance. 
In the third cut, I am interested in the fact that Sueli theorizes the collective dimension of thought in terms of resonance. Resonance seems to be placed at the core of the social bond. We enter in resonance together. We synchronize our resonances to the same political object and we are thus part of a collective. This collective is not defined in terms of ident identification or as it is the case in Freud's work by having put the same object, which is either the leader or an abstract principle um, or idea in the place of the ego ideal. Um, Sueli talks about the psychic phenomena that lie beyond identification. She talks about vital joy, which refers to recuperating and enhancing the power to decipher the forces of the body in a way that gives us access to a new rhythm of life. So my question here is how can we take further these notes on resonance and rhythm? These are enigmatic ideas from the perspective of social theory. Um, we do have thinkers like um, Henri Lefebvre, for instance, and his small important book, Rhythm Analysis, but it seems to me that there are silences in social theory about the question of rhythm and synchronicity. Um, in my own work, I speak about rhythmic attunement, synchronic entanglements, and the pleasure of analogy. I think about collective creativity precisely as a phenomenon of rhythm. Synchronicity is not a private affair. And here I would like to ask um, Sueli a question about asynchronicity or disattunement. Is it that capitalism is dominant not only because it has succeeded to imprint its rhythm on an era, but because through a myriad of operations, it has managed to guard and normalize a state of asynchronicity. Um, so I believe domination is an exercise of desynchronizing or maintaining selves and parts of selves um, in a desynchronized state or even inhibiting or interrupting the cooperation of organs. Um, in the fourth um, cut, and I, I believe I, I will stop here and um, I can ask about the fifth one in the questions. Um, I would like to briefly talk about trauma because I noticed the presence um, of the idea of trauma in the book. So Sueli does not move away from trauma as many thinkers of our time do. Um, but she stays with the difficulty of this concept. Why? Because, what she call, because of what she calls the abuse of life and the pimping of life, which involve a level of fragility and of suffering that amounts to um, breakdown and psychic fragmentation. So Sueli Rolnik is interested in understanding the active response to trauma, where I quote, the scope of our gaze expands in a way that allows us to be more capable of accessing the effects of violence on our bodies. There is a certain inventiveness or creativity that goes on, uh, goes hand in hand with a curiosity about our own wounds. The movement here is not one of magically healing the wound or turning away from the wound, but precisely turning to the wound. So I ask, why do we need to persist in using the word trauma and which aspects of it need resignifying? And, and as I say, the, the fifth one is about the idea of coup and the modality of the coup, but I'm sure we can return to it. So um, I can finish here. Thank you very much. And thank you for this um, extraordinary book. Thank you, Raluca. Ramsey. Hope you all can hear me. So um, thanks so much to the organizers of this event, to the author of this amazing book, and to everyone who's here attending virtually. I'm thrilled to be here to celebrate the translation and publication of Sueli Rolnik's Spheres of Insurrection, an important and inspiring book. I'll have more to say in just a moment about why I think the book's important and how I think it's inspiring. But first I'd like to offer what some screenwriters call a bit of backstory. I had the pleasure and privilege of meeting Sueli Rolnik once last year in Sao Paulo. 
What struck me about her immediately and throughout the evening we spent together was her energy, her excitement, the vitality of her curiosity, the dynamism of her conversation, her engaged and engaging way of moving through the city and it seemed to me, the world. Now, I'm a fast talker also, and so I had the satisfying sense I sometimes have that I'd come into contact with a kindred spirit, someone who shared my affinity for rapid fire exchange. I've since learned from spheres of insurrection to understand this response, this sense of a shared frequency as a matter of resonance rather than recognition. That's a distinction Raluca mentioned and maybe one we can return to later on. At the time, when I traveled to Brazil, my response to Rolnik was all the more striking because I'd been feeling depleted, exhausted, overworked, and under pressure. Maybe I was coming out of a low-grade depression because the telltale symptom of that condition, for me at least, had recently returned. I felt smudged, as if someone had run an eraser over outlines that had once been clear and vivid blurring my perception and sense of purpose, both. This then was the psychic baggage that I brought with me to my meeting with Sueli. It made my admiration for her that much greater, and I admit it also meant that admiration was laced with light envy. Here, I thought, was someone who embodied the openness to the world for which she argued in her work. Here was someone who had managed to undo her numbness, I'm quoting Sueli, to become unblocked, someone who'd refused, quote, to renounce desire in its active potency, end, end quote, and found a way to channel that desire. So I've taken those phrases from the 10 suggestions for the practice of decolonizing the unconscious that end Rolnik's book, and I quote from those suggestions here in order to underscore how sincere I think the author is in treating them as words to live by. They're not just imperatives that she delivers or armchair prescriptions that she sends our way, they're principles, quote, inextricably ethical, aesthetic, political, clinical, and critical, end quote, that she embraces and models, or so it seemed to me last year in Sao Paulo. We met the day before Jair Bolsonaro flew, flew back to Brazil from Florida, and that evening a phrase kept occurring to me. I kept thinking, speaking of prescriptions, I want to take what she's taking. So before our conversation came to an end, I worked up the nerve to ask Rolnik how she accounted for her own vitality what she thought the source of her intellectual and social energy might be. She answered without hesitation and with a nod to Guattari, she said, the three ecologies. So this wasn't a remedy so much as a reading recommendation since the answer referred both to a concept and to the title of a work by Guattari in which that concept is elaborated. In this sense, her answer reminded me of a claim of Watari's, one that Rolnik quotes in other work, and I'll repeat, quote, we should prescribe poetry in the same way that vitamins are prescribed, end quote. Watari makes this claim just after he says, quoting him again, I consider poetry to be one of the most important components of human existence, end quote. He's referring to his own penchant for poetry, and he's thinking of poetry as a specific verbal art. But it's also possible to hear poetry in this context, the word poetry, as a name for the aesthetic more generally, where, as in spheres of insurrection, the aesthetic is defined as a creating capacity that exceeds the reifying, rigid, and consumer-friendly confines of what Rolnik calls quote, mere creativity, placed in the service of the composition of new scenarios for the accumulation of capital, end quote. In other words, Rolnik writes in Sergio Delgado Moya's vibrant translation, our, quote, vital 
potency is redirected and used for the reproduction of the instituted. The different pieces of what's already instituted are shuffled around or slightly altered in a more or less creative way, end quote. So the aesthetic is conscripted, corralled, and set to work to this end for Rolnik, I think, right? It becomes a mechanism for the capture and what she calls the abuse of our desire, rather than a channel for the force that could change us and the instituted if we'd let it. Far from enlivening, aesthetic forms under these conditions deaden us or turn us into zombies. Far from undermining, they shore up what Rolnik calls the, quote, anthropophallo ego logocentric subjectivity proper to modern Western pimp colonial capitalist culture. They worsen widespread, quote, putrefaction in the life of the social body, end quote. And rather than enabling, they forestall, one more time quoting Rolnik, transindividual metamorphosis. During the time I have left, I'd like to stay with Rolnik's account of this process of capture and containment, for which kafechinajem, or pimping, serves as a shorthand throughout the book. Indeed, Rolnik writes early on, quote, the pimping of potency is nothing less than the micropolitical principle of the colonial capitalistic regime that governs the whole planet, end quote. I'll briefly consider two of her examples and then add one of my own. And I should, I should clarify that I turn to these examples with a set of animating questions in mind. If for Rolnik, the aesthetic and the clinical are inextricable from one another, then what would it take to recover what she calls the underground potency of the former, of the aesthetic? Just as Rolnik urges us to recast psychoanalysis as a practice of micropolitical insurrection, can poetry in Guattari's expanded sense become a counterpoison? Can it help us to rewrite the social script from which we read? That we read from such a script, playing parts and reciting lines others have written, is an observation Rolnik makes repeatedly in Spheres of Insurrection, and it becomes especially important in her third chapter, whose subtitle is A Series in Three Seasons. The series centers on the so-called soft coup that led to Lula's imprisonment, and it's a drama that people both watch and enact. Micropolitically, they become participants in the macropolitical spectacle as its, quote, plot is imposed on the imaginary of Brazilians, end quote, unrelentingly. So here the script is televisual, but for Rolnik, the televisual is just one instance, only the latest iteration of a much broader phenomenon. At one point, Rolnik compares this form of discourse manipulation, her phrase, to the catechism, framed as the word of God, transmitted by the Catholic Church, which she calls the Globo News Corporation of its time, and disseminated by the Jesuits, quoting her, the main news anchors for the church under colonialism. Remarkably, Rolnik suggests that the catechism and the new edition of the coup are, in this sense, continuous, in the sense of supplying a social script, right? Um, though the media for the transmission of that script are obviously very different. For me, the comparison between the catechism and the coup, the series, called another scene to memory. When I read it, I thought of Josie and the Pussycats, not the animated series from the 1970s, but the joyous satirical film from 2001 directed by Harry Elfant and Deborah Kaplan. The film follows three bandmates. Their band's name has always been the Pussycats, but they become Josie and, they pu and the Pussycats when they sign a deal with a powerful record company whose managers can't abide the idea of a leaderless ensemble and insist on individuation and hierarchy. This is key, and it turns out to mark the place where the micropolitical and the macropolitical meet because the record company turns out to be a front for a more sinister operation run with the approval of the US government, whose aim, to quote the character played amazingly by Parker Posey, is to, quote, turn the world into one giant TV commercial, end quote. 
The company traffics in subliminal, subliminal messages, which it covertly introduces into pop songs. Many of these messages push trends or implant cravings functioning like product placements to direct listeners' desires. But in a climactic scene, Josie finds a way to become conscious of the messages by isolating. So she's in a recording studio, right? She isolates a single track. And the message is of a different kind, not product placement, but, quote, you should have a solo career, a robotic male voice says. You could have your own prime time TV series. We could call it Josie. Right away, not requiring any further deprogramming, let alone psychoanalysis, the lead singer comes to understand that she's been brainwashed. They're selling stuff through our music, she says. They're selling us through our music, and that us resonates more broadly than she knows. It says they're selling all of us, not just the sellouts. Josie then thinks for a minute and delivers this memorable line, I'm a trend pimp. Right away, the spell is broken. She regains the capacity to act rather than react, and she refuses the social script from which she's been reading, joining instead without needing to lead an insurrection. So I'm not suggesting that the film's understanding of subjectivity and Rolniks are the same, of course. The film's satire is broad and its critique of ideology is deliberately silly, whereas Rolnik writes in another register altogether. I do think though, that we can see the film as an illustration of Rolnik's claim that, quote, under financialized capitalism, it became almost impossible to exercise creation even in the field of art because art became a privileged site for the pimping of the vital potency of creation, end quote. And yet Rolnik's virtuosic reading of Ligia Clark's Caminando in chapter one suggests that the aesthetic may remain a place of residual potency, that it can still put us in touch with a creating capacity that, can, that cannot, or at least has not been expropriated. Is Clark's proposition then, I end with these questions, an exception because it's both low tech and nonverbal? Or does something else account for Rolnik's return to Caminando? It occurs to me that long before Josie, Clark refused to be a trend pimp and became trans individual. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramsey. Um, two extraordinary presentations, both of them intense and <laughs> acute. So Sueli, I'm gonna leave it up to you. You're gonna have to unmute yourself and... <laughs> hey, bon. Thank you so much for those wonderful comments and wonderful ideas, you know, in dialogue. Uh, um, it's it's very clear that there is a real resonance, no, um, between what I propose and what you are elaborating in your works and in your life. And this is the best thing we can desire, no? <laughs> especially in this time we are living, where um, everything is in a total chaos, uh, very violently, no, and uh, where. Uh, the new edition of capitalism, uh, which became uh, uh, globalitarian, I like this word, it's a Milton Santos, a Brazilian geographer word, no? uh, became much more perverse than ever. No? <laughs> so, um, and, and we, are, we are, como que fala chão? Uh, el suelo? El suelo? The floor, the floor. Sorry, the floor, I had my. The floor is totally you know, dismantled. And when uh, Hamse said that when he met me in Sao Paulo last year, he was exhausted, he was depressed, he was overworked. Da, 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 da. This is the actual uh, state of our bodies, not Every, mm -hmm. everybody. No, it's a very, very difficult times and all the social. Uh, social um, networks or the social relations are totally fragilized, fra fragilized, no fragilized. 
Oh, well, so I want to thank you so much your comments and Haluka your comments, and also I want to confess publicly <laughs> that I'm very glad to be part of Critical South series. Uh, and so thank you so much, Natalia, <laughs> and also uh, to share this uh, international consortium <laughs> of, <laughs> of of critical theory um, differently, no different ways to do that or different ways to understand what thinking thinking means and i think that uh, raluca and ramsey talk about that no what is thinking uh which is super important today no so thank you everybody thank you brianna also she, she organized everything incredibly efficient <laughs> and very sweet at the same same time which is not so normal and also, I would like to 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 say an enormous thank you to Sergio Delgado. He's with us here, who made made an extraordinary translation of the book because it's very complicated. You know, we know that translations are very complicated, very complicated uh, task. <laughs> and because first of all, the person who translate must uh, must be totally must how you say it, must have a knowledge the consistent consistent knowledge of the language of the two languages and he must write well but it, this is nothing <laughs> if words uh, lose their soul so a translator must have link it to the soul and I will talk uh, about that uh, if not. Uh, the words are there. It's, it can be very nice, very intelligent. But as I said, the last ones, uh, the intelligence come after, <laughs> before there's something else there that that is seeking for the world. No, and I want to to talk about that. And so it was extraordinary to work with Sergio. We work on this translation for two years intensively. <laughs> And he was in total resonance with the soul of those words. So, and, and I learned a lot of English because of him also. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know from where I can begin, but I, I, I think that you begin uh, with this idea that what means word without soul, no? There is a Guarani word uh, to name word, to des designate word, which is nye which means word soul. In Latin language, you can say palabra alma, or in Portuguese, palabra alma, in Spanish, palabra alma. But in English, we can say it. Uh, even in French, you can say it. But why, why to Guarani people, uh, word or language in general come together with soul? No? And what soul means? Of course, <laughs> I will. Uh, describe what so means uh, to Guarani is not what Guarani people will, would say. Excuse me, my English. Huh? It's a very bad English, but I'm trying. <laughs> it's not, uh, of course, it's not what Guarani would say. I'm not representing Guarani thought, but the way that this word resonate, resonate with the marks in my, in my body of uh, some Europeans, you know, as a white woman, middle-class uh, intellectual uh, uh, daughter of uh, uh, Jewish immigrants from a local, et cetera, et cetera, Brazilian. Uh, in my generation, our, our, our for, for myself, our, for me, our training, our formation is totally European, especially French, no? because at my time, Paris was the, no? the big, big reference. And this, what I find in this word and other Guarani words uh, resonate totally with marks of some of those Europeans, no? Uh, those I, I choose as my ancestrals in this heritage. <laughs> and those Europeans are exactly the philosophers that dedicate all their life, all their life from the beginning to the end in order to displaced, deviate uh, from, from the dominant politics of production of thought in, in Western um, Europe, 
no? And not only to displace, but to construct an, another way, no? So what means so? Of course, what I will say is something between me and Guarani. It's not Guarani, it's not so really before meeting this word, no? Uh, so is, is, the, uh, is, is the ensemble of uh, potencies of each body, which is singular, but it's not come a, a package, um pacote, <laughs> uh, clothes. It is in interaction necessarily with all the forces that compose an ecosystem, no? Not only an, an environmental ecosystem, but also social, subjective, et, et, subjective uh, ecosystem, as you Ram say, remember, I talk about three ecologies. I didn't remember that. But for me, this is very important. And, and in those interactions, in those interactions, they change uh, the state of the body. They compose with the body and they change the body, no? if, we, if we let it. No? Uh, so the soul is of each one is this ensemble of potencies in interaction on all these forces that is an endless process of, tra of transmutation. No? Well, and they have another word to uh, garganta, como se dice, truth, truth, truth. Uh, it's difficult this word to pronounce. Uh, which is uh, which means nest of words. <laughs> this is a nest of words. Mm -hmm. If it is a nest, it's because for them, words began as embryos. If they began as embryos, it's because we are fecundados, como se dice? Fecundados? Fecundate, no? Mm. Ah. How would you say fecundados? Um... It's fertilized. It's fertilized? No? fertilized? Okay. Fertilized. By those forces with which we are in interaction, no? Mm -hmm. And it, it produces in our body as a, a, a germ of future, an embryo of future, no? Mm -hmm. and, but, and, and we, we, um, and this experience of embryo of future that nest in our body, no? <laughs> It's, it's totally real, it's not a metaphor, it's totally real. And it produces estrangement, no? It produces a kind of malaise, no? Uh, it's a strange, because the way th this body is materialized doesn't make sense anymore. When I say the way this body is materialized, this body is all the field of relation, all the social uh, trend, no? Uh, doesn't make sense anymore because it was a way, if life was materialized in this form, it, it, it now life is demanding uh, a new form to be created in order to regain what Haluka, one of her comments was about that, in order to life to regain the rhythm in its movement, no? As life is suffocated in, in natural form because there is, or already a germ of uh, another word with which is waiting and demanding for us to materialize it. One of the things that I, I love most in Haluka comments is when you talk about, uh, it's really nice, this one second. Ah, you for you, it was very important and you gave your words to that and I like your words to say it, materializing force, no? or Ma material semiotic experimentation no? and material semiotic come together, no? materializing force. No? Well, uh, for me, um, well, so when we are in this strange uh, situation, no? which is our drive condition, drive, no? Pulsão condition. Mm -hmm. Uh, between something that is there but doesn't not that, uh, lose its sense and something that is there but has not word and language yet, no? Uh, in that point, different politics of desire are defined. And this is what, what I called the micropolitical sphere is a kind of dispute, combat between different responses of desire to that strangeness, eh? uh, this experience of strange familiar. In, I like in Portuguese, uh, um Heimlich was uh, translated by 
a strange familiar. I like this mm -hmm. because it's exactly that. It's like if it, we were we are in a how do you say corda bamba? A trope, high trope, how is Corda bamba, equilibrista. Mm, uh, tight high tight trope. Tight tight tro Tight trope. Yeah. Tight We are like our uh, drive condition is like a, a tight rope, and we are there uh, between something that has no more sense and something that is there that has important. Yeah, no. And the way we deal with that, and it has totally to do with the cutting that uh, both of you bought, no, in your comments, this cutting of Lisa Clark's work, no, uh, because if we can stay support to sustain ourselves in this strangeness uh, between those two those two forces that are that that uh, inhabit us no uh, and if we can uh, be up to um, support the the temporality of a germination no uh, if our spirit Spirit in the in the sense of uh, because spirit is a very complicated word, no. <laughs> spirit in the sense of our potency to think, thought, no. If thought is connected to this to this tension, the drive tension between those two directions, no. Uh, they it, it can it, it it will decipher what's going on, and it will decipher what has lose uh, sense in one side and what is demanding to come into existence in the other side. And then as desire is orientated by our thought, by our spirit, no? desire to act in order to produce conditions to uh, this embryos of future uh, could come in, uh, into existence. No, excuse me, my English, but you understand what I'm saying, mm -hmm. yeah? So, but if if I am disconnected, if my spirit is uh, is disconnected my uh, of the, uh, with the body, where this tension, drive tension, is there, no, uh, the the uh, spirit will anyway try to make sense to what's going on to recover an equilibrium, but uh, he will decide with inadequate inadequate idea, as Spinoza called it, no. Uh, and it will because it will decipher projecting projecting images representations that he associate with this situation uh, images and representations of the repertoire uh, dominant repertoire that is there no so it will uh, conduct desire to act in order to to take something that is always there and reproduce it. the result is it will be a reproduction of the same no and worse of that what is worse what is worse is that what is there to to come no uh, those in the germination of those environments of future will be interrupted and when in an in individual action, this future is in, this germination is interrupted, it is not a matter of this individual, because if, if it was that, no problem. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the problem is that this body is part of the ecosystem. So it's a part of the ecosystem system with which is necrosite, no? With, the germination is stopped. It, it can't go on. It's interrupted. No, and 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 the act, uh, the response, the the answer, desire would be to reproduce and reproduce. What I'm saying that because for me, uh, if we understand the uh, regime of unconscious as the kind of um, how say manage management of the fabric fabrica de mundo fabric. Fabrica, uh, uh, fabric of world, fabric of subjectivity, no, uh, the fabric that produces subjectivity, the, the the status of otherness, the relational otherness, the kind of uh, of um, of uh, tra trauma that is uh, constructed uh, with this kind of subjectivity and this kind of the status of the other, the relation. Um, 
uh, with the other, no? Um, so uh, see, if we understand like that, what I call the regime of unconscious, which is the micropolitical sphere, no? We can, we can think that a system is not an abstraction at all. If it was an abstraction, it was like that, there are no uh, consequence in reality, no? But a system is embodied in a, in a mode of existence, no? So a system depends on a certain politics of production of reality, of production of subjectivity, relation to the other, etc. In order, and this gives the existential consistency to a system. If not, it couldn't sustain itself. So for me, it's very um, important. It, it's it, it, why it's very important to deal with the sphere, you know, this sphere, and then and this bring us uh, to the, those questions both of you put uh, about psychoanalysis and about uh, the relation between psychoanalysis and art. No. It's important because if you only uh, act politically in macro-political sphere, that is to say, in the sphere of the state of rights, civil rights, which is the form of governability of capitalism, no? If you only, uh, if you only act in that sphere, which is super important, of course, to fight uh, for rights, no, for equality. Yeah. But if you doesn't act in the way the production, the in the way in the politics of production of reality, if you doesn't act in that in that sphere, everything is reproduced. You can have uh, the most beautiful, incredible socialist experience. As I had in kibbutz when I was very young just after the creation of Israel state, no? And of course, everything, you come back to the same place. Of course, no? So for me, for me, uh, I, I, I reivindicate uh, the name of psychoanalysis to my work. It's a political choice because I think that Freud <laughs> had, in, an incredible uh, intuition about how function uh, uh, the production of subjectivity or what is the political of subjectivation in capitalist racial uh, uh, yeah. heterosis patriarchal capitalist world, but he doesn't realize, he didn't realize yeah. that what we call neurosis that he decided in an incredible way and not theoretically, theoretically, but he invent a ritual. I take psychoanalysis as a ritual, a ritual of experimentation in a relational field, no? Uh, of a displacement of this, uh, this policy of subjectivation. But he didn't realize that is not something of the human peace in general but it has to do with this, this uh, regime of unconscious, mm -hmm. no? capitalist, racial, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So everything of, all I'm saying here in, in certain way is in the book, mm -hmm. but from 2018, when I published it in Brazil until now, five and a half years, I, I went on working, no? Mm -hmm. and, and I try to make more precise what I call this regime of unconscious. And I, what I could share, I want to share with you, uh, and, and this permit me to, to answer many of the questions you, you, you elaborate, uh, you address to me, uh, is that the uh, gears of the fabric of world under this uh, regime of unconscious our principal two central gears, two principal gears. No? The first gear is that spirit was separate from the body, but not from the body. Uh, this is kind of cliche, no? It was separate from the living body. It was separate from the drive tension. It was separate of the experience of being uh, fertilized. <laughs> 
no, of being fertile uh, and, uh, and nesting, nesting uh, embryo of future, no? Mm -hmm. And with this separation, subjectivity separate from this experience, it is reduced, it reduced to ego, no? Reduced mm -hmm. to ego, no? And uh, what I, 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 I uh, uh, described just now, no? The response will be only the it will be always the re reproduction. But this not this not define what the what is the the relationship between this kind of uh, regime of unconscious and capitalism be because this we can describe as a reactive micro micropolity. Mm. The problem is that this man the manage, managers men of the fabric of work under this regime is exclusively reactive, no? Mm -hmm. This gear that separates the spirit from living body and subjectivity of the experience of a becoming other, no, I don't like this becoming because I, 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 did, I, I detest, uh, I don't like at all to repeat concepts, but I called it in my, my experience of insurrection, it turns individual, no? <laughs> uh, as subjectivity is totally separate from trans individual, no, and is exclusively that all the time. We only have a social cultural dispositives uh, to to incentivate that, and we don't have any dispositive to cultivate a, an active micropolitics. Micro and I think that psychoanalysis was born as a dispositive to activate an active micropod. Mm -hmm. But the second gear, which is also a kind of cliche, what I you say, but when we think that this cliche <laughs> is very important in the production of this kind of subjectivity, is that the kind of um, cultural repertoire or epistemology that the spirit will take to extract the representations, to project on what's going on because it is separate of the real <laughs> uh, uh, the real cause of what's going on, which is those embryos of future, no, that are effects of this interaction, no. Uh, this epistemology, and only in that way, I think that we can use this concept, no, this epistemology is defined by two cliches that we know since we are born, but that have a much more violent consequence that we, we can imagine, which is to think that the human species has a linear evolution né? from minus to more, no? mm. uh, and which is universal to all the species, human species, one thing. Second thing, also a cliche, but a very not neutral because it's very very violent is that the the concept the notion of race applicated to human being was invented at the at the end of the 15th century together with colonization and slavery no and this uh, notion at the beginning uh, was related to ways of being so in this linear supposed progressive evolution uh, the ways of being, they, they come from the more primitive and wild to the more civilized, and I hate the, the word civilization, <laughs> civiliz civilized way of being. And those civilized way of being, of course, are the way that uh, the uh, macho uh, from uh, colonial elites live, no? In that time and today, the way that macho of the financial market are okay. living, their way of living. But, but as we know, also another cliche, at the 19th century, um, the notion of race uh, received uh, fraude, fraudulento, fra fraud, 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 certificado, certification, certificate of scientificity. No, mm -hmm. as those differences are biological. So it, then it was totally naturalized, totally naturalized. Mm -hmm. And 
And so it is this kind of all those cliches that, oh, we don't agree with that, but it's much worse, it's much violent that just I don't agree with that because it has an enormous power in the production of reality, no? It's this kind of epistemology that is uh, projected on what's going on, no? And this produces ontology proper, this politics of ontology proper, uh, intrinsic to capitalism, mm -hmm. because it, it is exactly because of this separation that the response of desire to strange familiar, no? to the drive tension, which is constituted, no? it will be uh, to consume ideas or way of being or things or objects in order to recompose a recognized uh, uh, contour of ourselves mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and to be part, to belong again. Because this, uh, uh, those experiences of strangeness are lived as a menace. Uh, menace? Menace. Yeah. Menace of falling down in the racial hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So you must, you must recover, accumulate more narcissistic capital and social capital. Mm -hmm. And this is the basis of accumulation of capital in an economic uh, point of view. So mm -hmm. subject is, is it through those gears that's, that desire is totally orientated in order to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce infinitively. And I think that what we are living here now, the new strategy of fascism, of a new liberalism, no? which I, I, I worked a little bit in my book in the third chapter. No? For me, it was very important to elaborate this chapter. From then on, I, re, I work much more because, because when I wrote the book, uh, Bolsonaro was not elected yet. Mm -hmm. no? But from then on, we have an incredible experience of this kind of fascism, which is not, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, seem identical of the historical fascism, but the principle is the same. What I could say to, to, to stop also because I took many times is that this separation from between the spirit and the and, and the real cause of strangeness, which is those, the, the loss of sense of the kind of reality we are living and the real experience of something that is already there, but must come to, into existence. Huh? This is, is, is it, it, this separation goes to an extreme, but such an extreme level that it produces a real cognitive collapse cognitive collapse. We, as Brazil was the laboratory of this new strategy of power, and you are right, uh, Hamse, when you said, why new modality of who? Why not saying new modality of power? <laughs> no? uh, the, uh, we, Brazil, as Chile was the laboratory of the first uh, chapter of the neoliberal shift, in capitalism, uh, which went together with uh, um, dictatorships, military dictatorships, no? Chile from Pinochet. But Brazil was the big uh, main laboratory to this new uh, strategy of power, which now is totally spread bomb. Mm. Uh, poor, uh, I, 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 uh, Natalia. Argentina. Argentina Natalia, because what's yeah. going on in Argentina, it's much more smart than, than the strategy around Bolsonaro. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the way, mm -hmm. Because they have this uh, school, <laughs> four year school here. No? Mm -hmm, oh. mm -hmm. I, I, can, oh. can I can I um, intervene here a minute? Because I was listening yes, yes, to you, Soeli, and I kept thinking that one thing that both Ramsey and Raluca uh, um, returned to in your in in your readings of of Sueli, and this speaks to this particular moment has to do with the collective right um as a, that in a, in a way the collective will raluca you suggest you know maybe it will have or has the 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 force to cut through that fabric right mm -hmm. um 
and and the the the, the collective um, I think for you, Ramsey, in your reading, right, is is what unblocks. Mm. But I also wonder yeah. if one can should we retain the notion of subjectivity? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I want, and, I, and this is a question for the three of you, right? If in, a, in the decolonizing of the unconscious yeah. Yeah. Uh, that you are proposing, and even in the 10, you know, kind of last that you, you, you mentioned, Ramsey, right? That finale, these 10 suggestions for the practice of, like, are we, how do we, re, do we retain that notion? Is psychoanalytic practice um, or, you know, forms of cure through art, um, a, that allows for the potency of the collective to be articulated, like, does one keep the subject? Is it, and you even brought in, and you bringing in a, um, these two Guarani terms, right? We know that in, 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 in a, I will not say all, because I, I won't make that kind of statement, but in many, um, a, mm -hmm. among indigenous people, there, there, there is no notion of the subject. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if one is making recourse to that, I mean, so anyway, this is a little bit of a, a invitation also for, for, for further conversation a, among the three of you. And I don't know if Ramsey and, 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 and Raluca wanted to take that up, if it made sense. I, I would like to make a comment, uh, a quick okay. comment. Okay. okay. Because it permit me to answer to Haluke Hamsa's incredible question. Yeah. Uh, it, for me, first of all, the use of terms of words, uh, it was always like that for me. It's a kind. It is strategical. Yeah. Now it depends with whom we are talking mm -hmm. and what we want to mobilize. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me. It's a kind of provocation to maintain the word subjectivity and sub subject in order to point out all the time <laughs> that we are not, uh, the, the subject is not reduced to ego, no? That the, the ideas of individual and of identity are part of this fabric of work, no? And to, and to insist and insist and insist, you know? and this is the notion of drive, I think, in psychoanalysis that we must reconnect with our living body. Né? We must reconnect with our condition at, at living species, no species. And, and for me to go to the collective quickly, you know, for me, what is collective or what is the common, the way I understand the concept of common is the environmental, social and, and uh, mental uh, 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 eco ecosystem, no, which we are part of it, but it's, because it's very easy to say, I now I know that I am, we are part of the ecosystem, but to act that is not easy at all. And I think that psychoanalysis brings a, a, a way, a kind of ritual that aims that, but it makes totally difference with, if we understand that this disposity is dealing with the dominant mode of subjectivization in capitalism. It, and I found in uh, uh, Luca comments and also Ramsey comments, that's why I was so glad, you know, uh, that for them, they, it's totally linked, no? Uh, 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 Raluca makes sociology also. I, I also began with sociology and then I went to philosophy and then to psychanalysis, that's important. And you also, uh, uh, you have, uh, how say, relations with psychiatry, poetry, tarara, tarara, tarara. It goes together, no? It goes good together. So it, from that point of view, and I finished with that, um, uh, the idea of subject has nothing to do with the individual. <laughs> it has to do with this endless process that is an effect of those interactions with all elements of the ecosystem. No? <laughs> so the common, the common is part of it, and it's an endless process of transfiguration, which comes from the transmutations of life in those interactions. No? 
And I think this is very clear in both of your uh, comments. And what I like more, more is that you come with other words, other images, a very nice ideas about that, no? But how to think, and to finish, you you talk about the indigenous culture. I think that what's going on in the good way, no? <laughs> and what, what uh, uh, permit me not to follow in total depression uh, today, uh, sometime, <laughs> is that uh, th those new, the new uh, social movements, indigenous movements, Black movement, feminism, and the movements of those that are uh, that don't agree with the supposedly universality of the uh, concept of gender. Nah? Uh, I, I prefer to call it like that instead of LGBTQ plus. No, uh, they are intervening in the micropolitical sphere, and this is new in our history of those five centuries. Not because it does it never exists. Of course it exists, but there's a mass movement movement in different ways is the first time. So I think that this kind of thing, which is of course not in psychoanalysis because an indigenous culture or, or Afro uh, Latin American culture, their ancestrality, their rituals are totally rituals in order to reconnect the spirit with the fact of the exorcism in the body, no? Uh, psychoanalysis is what white people invented. Nice, <laughs> the only one. <laughs> but we must, and I agree to Haluka and him saying we must take psychoanalysis in, in that, the real rent psychoanalysis in that direction, no? And art was the only activity which was invented in 70th century as an institution in this culture. It doesn't exist in an indigenous called art as a separate activity. No? It, it is part of this potency of creation to give existence to what is coming, <laughs> what is there already. No? And uh, so the relation between art and psychoanalysis uh, is art. It's the only activity that we can act in order to give existence to what is seeking existence, no? But even though it's very rare, uh, rare that it, 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 uh, this kind of action is exercised in art. And psychoanalysis is another dispositive that can produce this reconnection, displace the subject of these policies of subjectivation in order to recover the potency of creation, the potency of creation, not in the sense of creativity that you comment now, uh, Ramsey, but in the sense to materialize, to take the word of Haluka that I, I appreciate a lot, to materialize was what is already there. No, but now I, I shut up and please, I want to listen to you. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Haluka, would you like to? Uh, yes, th thank you, um, um, Sueli, for all the um, re responses and forms of engagement. Um, I guess we are in resonance again, because my answer to uh, uh, Natalia's questions um, um, goes also in, in this recovering subjectivity um, to the extent that we're talking about the subject of the unconscious, mm -hmm. which is already de-individualized. Um, and also uh, contains perhaps an epistemology where we become curious about moments of singularizing something, mm -hmm. which are trans-individual, but uh, mm -hmm. they continue to be singular, no? like the symptom. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not individual, it's a constellation, it's a crystallization, it's something uh, that pertains to, to a moment and that can be addressed or touched in the consulting room. Um, no, but but um, involve these contradictory uh, forces, uh, and as you uh, uh, very nicely put it now, and uh, is present in the book as well. No, uh, talks to a kind of ecology where the yeah. impasse is never an individual impasse; it's a, it's a collective one. Um, and just a, a small um, um, addition um, on perhaps this. Um, 
um, certain disenchantment uh, uh, with the idea of drives. And I, I think that, again, if we talk about a, a psychoanalytic idea of subjectivity, um, I would say that we need to pluralize the drives. Uh, so not only the death drive and the life drive, but perhaps various kinds of um, life drive. Um, no, uh, thinkers like Cornelius Castoriadis, for instance, talk in, in, in that way, like how can we, uh, and of course Deleuze and Guattari as well, how can we uh, pluralize the, the, the drives? And I'm very interested in this pleasure of attunement or of analogy, of synchronizing something to something else, which of course, uh, as uh, Sueli uh, talks uh, about in the book, not in these terms, no, there are so many desynchronizing forces uh, but uh, thankfully with psychoanalysis, we can always imagine force and counterforce, no? So whatever synchronizing force capitalism is, we can always counterpose or uh, imagine a kind of opposite synchronizing force that uh, we can explore how we can access it. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. I, I want just to say to you, that for me, there doesn't exist that drive. No? Uh, I think you, you think the same. Uh, drive is life, a bit of drive is only <laughs> uh, life drive. But life drive is acted, exercised in different potencies, like Nietzsche <laughs> uh, uh, elaborated this very nice, no? different potencies. And, and, and the fight in the micropolitical uh, sphere is between different different potencies of life drive and and drive hasn't a content no that that's why now in my new book I, I'm writing a new book I, I put all the focus on drive tension what what is important is the drive tension but from drive tension what will be created is as you say Haluka is very multiple and very, it's very important that you said that the, the, each one produces symptoms in a single array, but also each one produces, uh, brings into existence what is there in single arrays. What is common is the ecosystem and the ecosystem is in all the bodies, no? But in each body is in a single array because it composed with different potencies, different languages, different histories, different marks of memory or include trauma, no? We didn't talk about trauma. Uh, and also the way it will be bring into existence the language, the way it will bring into existence is totally singular, but is with this, this different singularities uh, dealing with the same thing, which compose all the bodies all at the same time, is the common, <laughs> the common uh, it, it from, from is the way uh, of reconstructing the social field in another way. It depends on those singularities, no? But those singularities, single arrays to bring into existence, existence something which is common and is composed with all the bodies at the same time. Ramsey. Ramsey, do you want to chime no, in? Nothing to add, just maybe in the spirit of um, a commercial for the book. Um, I'll, say, <laughs> I'll say that um, I thought it was one of the most fascinating threads, this um, idea that there can be a form of subjectivity not reduced to the experience of the subject. It's mm -hmm. something I yeah, I picked up on early and kept reading for because I think it's really um, helpful. Um, and yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I think just to acknowledge that my attachment to um, my attachment to theories of subjectivity maybe comes from um, not only a sense that it's part of our inheritance, so we don't get to overthrow it um, that easily, um, but also the fact that I'm a scholar of poetry. So just to come out as um, as as that um that kind of scholar, but it's really interesting to hear um both Raluca's and Sueli's more clinically informed perspectives, which I really appreciate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also feel, and maybe this comes from also conversations with you, Sueli, over the years, that things like Ailton Krenak's notion of the sujeto colectivo, mm -hmm. right? From among indigenous people in Brazil, for example. Um who and the notion as a instead of like 
you know, a notion of subjectivity that is more linked to constellation. Yeah. Um, and that speaks, I think, to the question of resonance that uh, Raluca brings up, but also to the importance of Spinoza in, in your work, where I think that that is a moment where, um, a, right, contemporary to the, the development of the early colonial capitalist patri yeah. cis, patriarchal cis world uh, mm -hmm. that we're in, where I know that in uh, the importance of, 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 of thinking with Spinoza precisely to think about one, what you just said that there, <laughs> the drive is always a life drive of different types, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that also uh, perhaps the subject can only come into being really when as part of a collective that activates its potencia, that's right. right? And that's, that, that's when it can come about. Um, I wanted to, to uh, Mark Langdon sent, an, sent a message, uh, a question that says, um, that speaks to these questions. Do we, those wishing to move beyond the zombie colonial capitalism need to engage more with the notion of agnotology, the production of ignorance to address the epistemic violence of our current systems? Mm and or what do we need to unlearn to decolonize our collective subconscious right do we need to engage more with the production of ignorance um i i, I like that we recently hosted a, 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 in another context on campus um the extraordinary peruvian anthropology anthropologist and political ontologist Marisol de la Cadena, who gave a talk titled Not Knowing. Mm -hmm. And as a praxis, like what does it mean in, in a very similar set of questions. But anyway, mm -hmm. so the floor is open to any of you that might want to address Mark's question mm -hmm. uh, briefly, and then we might end there in, in recognition of people's time. I think it's it's worse than ignorance. Mm. It's a kind of cognitive collapse, you know. Mm. <laughs> I I can give you many examples, but I you don't I won't take the time. To, but mm. if you want, I can bring some incredible examples in Brazilian experience, no? Uh, and about uh, and and Ramsey, he put the for uh, uh, the. He focused the this wins the affect wisdom, no? Mm -hmm. Saber del affecto. Mm -hmm. No? El affect is exactly the sensation of the effect of the the, the ecosystem in our body, but uh, in this and the sensation that is always already deciphered, no? Mm -hmm. Affect. And <clears throat> The spirit, this gear that separates spirit from the living body is, to, is, is totally um, reduced to what I call uh, archive knowledge, mm -hmm. the archive of this epistemology of the world we are living in. And this other kind of knowledge, which is the deciphering of what's going on, the, what life is demanding in order to take bring it into existence, this is what I call affect uh, wisdom, no? It's saber del affecto, no? Mm -hmm. That we could call intuition. <laughs> uh, oh. It's very, very bad treated in our culture, no? Not, non por casualidad, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, eso. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Mm. Ramsey or Raluca, did you have something in response to that question? Yes, I am. Um, um, I would like to um, reflect uh, also on the on the spirit of psychoanalytic work uh, here. Mm. Which is a form of um, no systematized uh, working towards a good kind of unknowing, no mm -hmm. or this. Mm. Some mm. Of, you know, knowledge you know, that we hold about ourselves, which are not productive, are not uh, fruitful, you no, know, are not mm -hmm. uh, wisdom that uh, that mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is talking about. So they're not connecting us in a meaningful way to others, human, mm -hmm. human, and to uh, the the world around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So I, psychoanalytic uh, space is this space where we cultivate this unknowing. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, talking ba uh, back uh, to, to the idea of subject of the unconscious, we become uh, more and more comfortable with the idea that we can surprise ourselves and, and others, and we, we are not in full control um, mm -hmm. what we can produce uh, you know, in, in resonance with, with, with others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is what this the psychoanalytical ritual uh, mm -hmm. create the conditions for that, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why I think it's nice to call it a ritual. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ramsey, did you did, did you want to say something about this, or I can ask a couple other. I'll I'll just read out questions. Um, Angela Hennessy sends a, a a question that says, "Could you say?" The renunciation of the subject shares something with Barth's death of the author, which was rejected by many, especially Black feminists, who were coming from the position of being denied being an author altogether. Um, you can't really give up something you don't even have. So she's bringing in Angela the question of you know race and forms of racialization into uh, subjects and the uh, uh, for forms of dehumanization and someone uh, who chose to remain anonymous says when we think about constructing another future beyond capitalism how can we fight against our own colonization unconscious to change our practice not just intellectually but as citizens um those are two pretty large questions um <laughs> I... Oh, I, think, I think that race, uh, in many words, uh, race uh, gain a central place, no? Mm -hmm. Because it's much more, more important in this production of this kind of subjectivity that we can imagine, no? Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, uh, <clears throat> So I think in this recomposition of psychoanalysis, as uh, Raluca and Ramsey are reindicating, no, it must it must be there, no, mm -hmm. because uh, for instance, the, the stupid example I gave, when you are in this unstable state as we are mm -hmm. now, <laughs> mm -hmm. no because it doesn't make sense anymore it's totally violent and at the same time something is coming no um because of the because of the power of the notion of race applied to human species uh it has a very important role in our this in the desire response to this uh, instability no mm -hmm. because what is uh, what take us in in this moment is the fear of falling in the supposed mm -hmm. race, uh, racist hierarchy, not only race of color of skin, in all senses, class, uh, racism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I can say that uh, after uh, my book, all those years of this book we are discussing, all those years, the notion of race in the black movement in Brazil is the most important source of what I can try to elaborate more, more precisely. It comes from there, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, Raluca, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, not really that um, I'm thinking about a process of working through um, um, elements that have to do with race and a, a racist, um, system and also acknowledging our position in this system and working through whiteness as well. I think this is very mm -hmm. um, important and something that again is beyond the ego or beyond mm -hmm. um, simple cognition, just um, uh, making a, a statement. No, it's a, it's a uh, something akin to a working through where we have to position ourselves, reposition, no, and imagine ourselves 
um, in a racist scene where oftentimes we occupy the position of the one who dominates or the one mm -hmm. who uh, you know, is the aggressor. And that is a very hard thing to, to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, 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 in all those uh, movements in uh, South America, which has, are incredible, no? there are many, many, it's unfair. well, uh, critical selves. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, each country has one movement which is the most important. In Brazil, is the Black movement. Yeah. No? In Argentina, it's feminist movement, for instance. No? Mm -hmm. In Chile, it's uh, Mapuche movement. No? Mm -hmm. uh, um, and in Brazil, I think it's the only uh, a country in South America that uh, I'm dialoguing with uh, Hanuka, no? where white people, not everybody, of course, are totally tensioned now mm. by, 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 by the presence of racism in our subjectivity. No? Uh, as I said, mm -hmm. all those eight, eight, Seven last years, I'm totally dedicated to that, no? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't see that in the same way in other countries, but it's the only thing that Brazil is super, uh, and it's in a nice uh, social movement because the other countries, there are incredible things that are going on that are not going on here. But in this year, uh, we are totally tensioned by it. Mm -hmm. I raise it totally. No, totally. I mean, those who are not uh, zombies, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This and the is, first, uh, uh, it, 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 yeah, sorry, sorry. No, because the first, the, the first question that I didn't understand very well, but I understand the, I understood the, the end. She said, how to decolonize the unconscious, no? And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, we are talking about that here yeah. all the time. And of course, it doesn't mean that everybody must go to psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Because the same kind of experience you have in psychoanalysis, you have in many social movements, in, mm -hmm. in many collective in different ways. Psychoanalysis is a white dispositive, the only one. So mm -hmm. let's take it in our hand because, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. in fact, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also it, it makes me think that um, how important it is to remember in our current world where, you know, um, current, I mean, these past two months, um, since October 7th, the kind of a, international mobilization um, from, I mean, primarily, at least here in the U.S., not, not primarily, but very um, visibly from yeah. younger generations of a people of color taking mm -hmm. to the streets, understanding that the relationship between their critique of set the settler colonial project of Israel in its current form, the, um, the history of colonialism, the development of capitalism, of racial capitalism, um, are linked and that the practice that they're taking to the streets is a way of decolonizing the collective unconscious mm. I mean that is that that's that's my feeling like we are actually in that moment there's something very okay. uh, strong that is happening and that will generate a uh, create a generational divide between this these collective unconscious I think so so once again, I see your 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 work, Sueli, as 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 you know, bridging these worlds and these supposed distances. You talked about spirit and body, but also it's about yeah, you know, the the, the mind, um, the intellect, and 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 the force of the body out there on the street because it speaks again to our uh, to what's happening today, the um, the most terrible. A, 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 a genocide taking place a, in Palestine and among a, on Palestinian life, but also the kind of extraordinary forms of mobilization uh, to that tearing through that fabric of you know that which 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 Raluca called right that that how to that thick 
colonial capitalist unconscious. Mm. So thank you. Thank you, Sueli, for your book. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you, Ramsey and Raluca for your readings. Thank you all uh, in the audience uh, for being here with us. We're an hour and 45 into this and, and we still have 70 people with us. Um, um, we look forward to seeing you soon and I hope everyone takes rest and thank you. <laughs>